Hi, good afternoon. My name is Brandon Deutsch from PCCD. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bruno. Hello, my name is Becky Bruno and I'm the Legal Advocacy Coordinator with AWARE. Um, AWARE is located in Mercer County, Pennsylvania. If you head west, we're the last exit on I-80 before you enter Ohio. We border Youngstown. Today we're going to talk about the range of services we offer in the Legal Advocacy Program building the working relationships with the different systems within your county to fully support domestic violence and sexual assault victims and training the legal advocates beyond the man mandatory training. So we started back in 1998 as a part-time program at the request of our former president, Judge Fernelli, and our former district attorney, Epstein, to implement the new PFA for domestic violence victims. In 1999, we expanded to a full-time to full-time for uh, PFA, PFA support only because of the demand. And in 2003, we included legal advocacy support for sexual assault victims. And in 2004, we expanded the program to include criminal justice support as well. In 2006, we sought out satellite offices for our mobile legal advocate pilot program to serve rural victims who were limited on transportation. These satellite offices are separate from our uh, direct services locations. In 2007, we had another expansion, which includes a dedicated youth advocate and direct services to support minor sexual assault victims through the criminal court activity. And this does include court prep for trials. In, the, in 2009, we had another expansion to the legal advocacy program into its own division. We blended the program to equally serve victims of all ages who experienced either domestic violence and sexual assault. And also in 2009, the Rural Legal Advocacy Program, the pilot program, named, uh, the name changed to the Mobile Legal Advocacy to reflect a countywide service. Now our Rural Legal Advocacy pilot program broke down transportation barriers here in Mercer County for rural victims. Um, we, we have a serious, it's serious transportation issue here in Mercer County, so we needed to figure out a way to break down those barriers for our uh, victims in our rural communities. The Rural Legal Advocacy Pilot Program included a mobile legal advocate who also provided systems work with, with our rural uh, MDJ offices and our local law enforcement. And the pilot program, which is, was a huge success, we served three times the number of rural victims as projected, and the funding for this program came from un local United Way dollars to help us demonstrate the impact and reach. This laid the groundwork for other grants that we were able to sustain. And in 2012, at the request of our district attorney's office, we expanded the program to include preliminary hearing support for victims. We have been able to sustain funding for this part-time program through STOP funds to meet the uh, needs of victims. So this is what we currently look like today. So we started with a part-time advocate, and now you can see um, what we look like today. The Legal Advocacy Program has currently added a part-time counselor advocate to respond to our forensics program who works with justice involved women and in our elder, elder victim advocacy program. And then one asset that we have is having dedicated criminal investigators. Um, I've been with AWARE for about 10 years now and when, in, in my early days, we didn't always have a sheriff's deputy available at our protection order hearings. So I came up with the idea of having one of our criminal, our criminal investigators um, attend all of our protection order hearings just so we would ensure the victim's safety and someone there to, would have arrest authorities. And the other uh, criminal investigator handles investigating our sexual assault and domestic violence cases. He was so skilled with one interview with the victim, he was able to charge the perp with 85 charges. And all of our criminal investigators are retired state police. Excuse me, Rebecca? Yes. Hey, this is Brandon. Hey, um, your slot, the slides aren't changing. Okay. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. There you go. How about now? Yep, 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 okay. yep. 
Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Not a problem. There will be technical issues, I'm sure. Um, so our legal advocacy program structure, the staff in the legal advocacy program all have a criminal justice focus and all are degreed. Um, I have several different, um, I have a ton of manuals, uh, whether they're civil, criminal, and um, PFAD. I'll, later in the uh, presentation, I'll be sharing with you that we are uh, the PFAD designees for the county for any protection order input. Um, we have a separate office location from the courthouse that expanded when we got in 2009 when we got the stock grant. And recently we expanded with more space due to the, the another expansion for the forensic focus. <clears throat> All we pay for is the internet and phone usage. Our, we do not pay any rent. The county um, donated the office suite to us because they know we save them money. Our legal advocacy program has developed a customer service focus and victims feel heard and validated. And one of the, uh, our mobile legal advocate, she is in charge of the criminal case uh, status tracking database. This allows us to provide the victim with accurate, up-to-date information on their case. And it also keeps us up to, up to date on any possible pleadings and how offenders are held accountable. So some of our legal advocacy program enhancements, um, in my early days, as any, a, any agency, we have a lot of paperwork. So I wanted to be able to combine that paperwork. Um, and it, and it, we did that by utilizing a handbook. It addresses all the administrative needs and it serves as a true resource for the victims. You know, it, victims are coming in seeking a protection order, um, very stressed. So that gives them something that they can take home and and able to process when they're when when they're feeling calmer. I also developed a the court navigator program. This is to serve the adult domestic violence victims going through the protection order process. And I will go into detail further in the uh, presentation about our court navigator program. Our legal advocates do monthly follow up calls and case status updates with the victims. This builds trust and safety planning, and also allows access to our other services here at AWARE. So my plan B, I, in my early days, I was seeing a lot of frustration from some of our victims who, you know, the protection order was denied and they were leaving the courthouse, you know, feeling hopeless. So I came up with a plan B. And if a protection order were, was to get denied, then I would take them up to the district attorney's office to, pri to file a private criminal complaint. And I've had nothing, we've had nothing but positive feedback from that, from um, the private criminal complaints, because it is actually our cr criminal investigators um, that are doing the investigations on those private com criminal complaints. So we don't lose them, lose those cases, um, since we have such a close working relationship with our county investigators. So here's some new programs that we're uh, working under the legal advocacy umbrella. And I'm gonna go into further detail and do some highlighting from each of those programs. So our Heal to Heal program. I am very, um, I love dogs. So I wanted to, in, in my early days here, I wanted to inc incorporate um, victim advocacy and unconditional love. So what better way to ease the stress and anxiety than the, having an opportunity to pet a dog, a therapy dog, um, before their protection order hearing. So I was able to meet with our president judge, the county commissioners, the district, attor district attorney, and the court administrator to get approval. And um, thankfully, they all, hands down, agreed with me. Um, what better what better way to ease the stress and anxiety when facing your perpetrator or any pretty much any major um, anything major going in your life than petting a dog right before the hearing. So the victim has an opportunity to do that if they choose to. The agency secured additional insurance for the dogs and the hand handlers are all also covered under the agency volunteers. Um, all of the hand handles have to handlers, excuse me, have to go through um, the AWARE training. And I have attached our the ma magazine article from Views and Voices um, in the handout. So please feel free to take a look at that at 
your leisure. So I'm not sure if all of you remember the budget crisis of 2015, but I sure do. Um, that is one thing I will never forget because I went, I ended up being a program of one and it was for quite some time and I needed to figure out a way to how am I going to meet these victims needs at a no cost. So that led to the implementing the court navigator program. Um, the court navigator program is comprised of all volunteers and interns. They are required to do all of the aware, uh, mandatory, mandatory training, and when they come up here to the legal advocacy program, they have to, um, they're subject to more training. And this program was developed to not only during the budget crisis, um, but it was developed to free up the legal advocates to focus on our criminal cases, specifically our sexual assault cases. The court navigators are limited to only working with excuse me, our protection order hearings with adult domestic violence victims. And it has been a huge success. I've probably over the years had at least 20 to 30 court navigators. And in fact, we've actually hired a few of them within the agency. I'm working on a visitation, supervised visitation exchange program. Um, the, this program is in its early development phase. Currently, Mercer County does not have a designated location for supervised visits nor custody exchanges. And this program will allow for a safe location for both the parent and child. Um, right now, our custody exchanges are being held at um, Sheets, at the Walmart. Um, we see a lot of our, a lot of protect PFA violations that come out of these uh, supervise these uh, custody exchanges. So it is, it is a true need for our county. We did have a domestic violence homicide during the pandemic where the victim was shot execution style in front of their minor child during the custody exchange. Um, as I'm sure all of your counties do saw an increase of domestic violence during the pandemic as we definitely have. Eventually, um, we would like to have two locations within Mercer County uh, for, for exchange sites only because we have such a serious issue of, of transportation, transportation issues and barriers. And I recently had submitted a federal grant in January, so fingers crossed we'll be able to secure that funding. I also worked with um, all of our, our county partners in securing a site and developing a model of what a supervised visitation exchange pro program would look like here in Mercer County. So recently, as I stated, we've uh, expanded to include the forensic program, which is um, provide services to the Mercer County Jail and the state prison. Um, the services we'll be providing is to justice involved women and working with the Mercer County Jail on a discharge plan to ensure the victim is surrounded with the necessary services and res resources upon their release. Also to make sure that they're not going back to their abuser. Uh, we do not want um, any, any of our victims being released and having to go back, going to go back to the same situation. So we are currently working with um, the Mercer County Jail, uh, Behavioral Health, uh, Probation Parole, uh, and Northwest Serv Family Services of Pennsylvania on what a discharge plan would look like here in Mercer County. This program also includes in, provides training and a close working relationship with uh, the state prison here in Mercer for PREA. Our elder victim advocacy program, we just came on, that just came also under the legal advocacy program's umbrella. We've had a, always had a close working relationship with Mercer County's Agency on Aging um, for many years. We see a lot of seniors utilizing the protection order process, whether on behalf of themselves or on behalf of their grandchildren due to the opiate crisis. Um, you know, we don't really see many seniors going through the criminal justice part of the system. We see them mainly coming through the civil protection order process. Um, and we also partner with aging while providing individual services to senior victims, as well as providing community outreach and training to the various senior centers 
and assisted living facilities. So I facilitate the Mercer County Human Trafficking Collaborative. In 2019, AWARE hosted a, a summit for the county. We brought in many different educators surrounding human trafficking. And at the end of that summit, we did a call to action, which initiated the Mercer County Human Trafficking Collaborative. The collaborative's mission is to respond and assist victims impacted by human trafficking by building a countywide comprehensive collaboration to provide victims of human trafficking the support and services needed to heal and empower their lives. The collaborative is comprised of various community partners coming together to raise awareness and provide education on human trafficking. We've hosted um, many trainings presented by Homeland Security Investigations for our local community, um, whether that was forensic interviewing for child sexual assault victims, um, we brought in Homeland Security for uh, the banking community of what money laundering looks like. Um, and the U.S. Attorney's Office has participated and the Salvation Army has participated in coll the collaborative meetings as well. Um, so we're definitely thankful for that partnership. So that wraps up the legal advocacy services we provide. And now we're going to move on to the how to's for developing working relationships with your community partners. So when I when I began my career at, here at Aware, my main one of my main goals was how am I going to how do we build these system re relationships because everybody needs to be on the same page and have the same agenda. And how I did that is I set up individual meetings with each one of our our systems. And whether it was going out to lunch or taking them out for a cup of coffee, um, nowadays it's Zoom um, due to the pandemic. But I think it's very important that you, well, I, I do. I think it's very important that you set up the meetings individually and not in a, in a group. Um, <clears throat> also then to be sure to follow up with them, whether it's an email or a phone call. Um, I always like sending uh, thank you letters, thank you notes. Um, it just shows you're taking the extra step with the thank you card. I, I do like this method. Um, it just shows the, your community partner that you value their time. Um, and you also need to show your support. There has to be some benefit for both the partners in a working relationship. relationship. So highlight how your idea will be able to support them. And then obviously, obviously you need cooperation. I mean, all, all the systems coming together must cooperate with each other because I'm famous for saying all the time, you know, it's not about you or me, it's about the victim what the victim needs. And now we're gonna move on to some of the community partners we work with daily here in the Legal Advocacy Program. So our initial relationship with our Prothonotary stop, uh, Office established was established by our President Judge Fernelli in 1998 when the PFA, um, the protection order came in effect. Pretty much when a victim presents themselves at the prothonotary's office at the courthouse, then one of the prothonotary's office ladies calls a legal advocate and we go over and assist support and guide through the protection order process. Now, if there's a conflict of interest um, for AWARE, uh, then it is either the prothonotary staff's going to provide the assistance or they're going to call down a law clerk uh, to execute the protection order. And the same with, you know, if, if where is that a staff, have a staff meeting or the office is closed, um, it's the prothonotary's office or the uh, law clerk that provides the support um, when we're not available. And when the new, newly elected prothonotary came in, her and I actually had a prior working relationship because I came from county probation. And um, we, I mean, our numbers increased by 184% because of that working relationship in my first year of working at AWARE. So our, pre our pre former president judge, uh, Dobson and Fernelli and our current president, Judge Yates, have been strongly supportive of AWARE's legal advocacy program. They supported the uh, pilot program that is now the mobile legal advocacy program 
and we keep I keep them up to date during their monthly luncheon meetings. Um, and the legal advocacy program began managing PFAD back in 2009 when we uh, got the got the stop grant. And um, one of my legal advocates is actually acts as the personatory designee in that grant. We do offer PFAD training to law clerks in our local law enforcement. Actually, anytime any any new law clerk is hired, they have to go through the required PFAD training. Um, and then any newly hired officers, the chiefs usually reach out to me to, to ensure that uh, their newly hired officers are on the same page as everyone else when it comes to PFAD. And in 2015, the protect, emergency protection order protocol was re revised at the request of the president judge to better serve victims. And then the emergency protection orders is after um, courthouse business hours. In 2016, we got the approval for the Heal to Heal program. 2017, we got the approval for the Court Navigator program. And I'm currently working with the President Judge um, on the development of the Supervised Visitation Exchange program. And then we do host an annual, um, an annual meeting for our judges just to identify their needs and any gaps in services there, there may be. Um, very, very we've always had an open door relationship with our president judges and I'm so forever thankful for that because it's all about serving the victim. Uh, for our sheriffs, we've always had a long-term uh, working relationship with our sheriff's department. Um, we, I think it's two, two prior sheriffs were, was a board member for quite some time. Um, we had the expansion in 2015 with the expansion for the civil protection orders to include the sexual violence protection order and the pr protection from intimidation. Um, that required multiple deputies and serving those orders. And we can assure that the victim, we can assure the victim will have same day service on the defendants. We were able to carve out some funding for our local sheriff's department through the stock grant. I'm just showing, just showing support, cooperation, and respect for our partners. Uh, for our state police, um, we share the PFAD management with the Mercer Barracks. We've had a, a work, long working relationship, but that really evolved in 2009 due to the due to PFAD and the stop grant. Um, we, in 2012, state police took the initiative for countywide sexual assault pro protocol. And 2015, the protocol was adapted to include drug facilitated sexual assault and campus security. Uh, we do have collateral support with them. Uh, we worked with the state police for over three years during our uh, one of our emergency housing sites project, our Brandy Montgomery House, house um, located in Northern Mercer County and it serves the Grove City, Grove City area. Continuing on with local law enforcement, um, like I said, we've had a long history with them. It dates back to 1976 when AWARE started as the Rape Crisis Center. We do compensate their time for any complete training, whether it's online or in person. So like I said, we had the Homeland Security investigators come out and provide training for forensic interviewing and we were able to compensate our police for coming out to that training um, we partner with them on our start and dark call outs to the hospitals and our website has new learning online system for our lo law enforcement which include both domestic violence and sexual assault i um, actually have six courses online for them um, I, d I do like the online training because, you know, they operate in three shifts and that way we didn't have to worry about getting going out there to each roll call um, for each shift. They can actually do it um, on their own. And it is quite it has been quite successful. Continuing on with law enforcement, we host an annual chief's luncheon um, every year. This is to show our appreciation for all that they do and identify their needs. We provide protection order training for them and campus security. And in 2015, we implemented, implemented the LAP program, and that has been a huge success, um, not only for our victims, for our local law enforcement as well. 
Um, you know, I, I do know that some of them take uh, the, the screening tools with them when they have to testify in court. Um, just, it just shows that they're, they're taking the extra step for that victim. And every year we have a representative for our local law enforcement that attend the End Violence Against Women International Conference. And you know, it, it's telling when they, when they actually attend this conference and, and their focus just changes after, after all the trainings that they receive at this conference. This con that conference is such a wonderful networking and educational tool for, um, for this field. I truly, truly believe that. We've actually had our uh, police chiefs come back and change some of their domestic violence and sexual assault protocols due to what they learned at, um, at the end violence conference. Working with our district attorney's office that our former re working relationship with the district attorney's office started in 1982 with the district attorney Epstein providing volunteer training on how to support victims through the through court during the 1980s. The, uh, he, we work with them with the evolution of the SART. Um, the DA started the project to have a structure in place to better serve uh, sexual assault victims. Um, our elder in 2007, our elder elder victim advocacy program um, is now a successful program model throughout the state. And in 2015, um, the DA do when the, when we had change in leadership at the district attorney's office, some of our cases were reconsidered. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if you, any of you are aware of the Glavin Ivy case. Um, he was a serial rapist, um, and due to the reconsidering of that case, he is now serving 19 to 66 years just on one um, on one case. That was the uh, that was a victim interview that resulted in 85 charges. In 2017, we began the discuss, discussion of having a, a special victims unit for sexual assault, domestic violence, um, including our, our elder victims. And in 2018, our legal advocacy program, um, we had another expansion with the district attorney's office. You know, it includes the preliminary hearings and also with with interviews with the district attorney. They um, in they involve one of our legal advocates in all their interviews, their court prep, and their trials. Here are some other of our community collaborations. Um, we combined, it, combined our criminal justice advisory board and our stop team meetings um, because both of them, both of those groups have pretty much the same community partners. So instead of um, having two individual meetings, we were able to combine them. And our focus is meeting the victim's needs and working on different uh, initiatives for victims. Uh, Chiefs Association meetings, the, I'll be the first to tell you that our successes from the legal advocacy program is a direct outcome of our, what our law enforcement does on the ground. Um, our number one referral here is from our local law enforcement. Um, our community health partnership works with the Department of Health initiatives and um, the Elder Victim Advocacy Task Force works out of that partnership as well. Um, I shared with you about the Mercer County Human Trafficking Collaboratives, various partners whose mission is to raise awareness on human trafficking and provide education to the community. Um, the U U.S. Attorney Operation 10 Coalition, I was invited, I think in, it was back in May, to be part of our Western District's Operation 10, uh, Trafficking Ends Now Coalition. Um, I was very honored to, to be able to be part of such a wonderful co coalition and to be able to bring back resources to our local collaborative. Uh, we partner with our Children Advocacy Center. Or we have a de uh, dedicated youth advocate, also which also supports the minor sexual assault victims through the criminal justice systems, as well as the legal advocate. We work with our Chambers of Commer Commerce to provide sexual harassment education and campus engagement. Um, we provide uh, freshman orientation. We provide um, aware service, what about all of our ser services, and then education around the sexual violence protection order for the incoming freshmen. 
So that wraps up um, our the legal advocacy systems work, uh, what we see mainly on a daily basis. Now we're going to go into and talk about how to standardize your legal advocacy program beyond the mandated uh, mandatory training. So once all of the required training is done for any of our new hires, they begin um, they begin their legal advocacy training. And it's I, I'm not going to lie to you, it's pretty in depth. Uh, I cannot I cannot have an advocate going over to support or assist a victim who I don't feel is ready to do to be doing that. Not only for them, but for the for absolutely for the victim. So the the shad the the manuals and and I have everything in manuals and I have everything is scripted. I never want a victim to feel blindsided by anything. I mean they've already been um, abused or raped by by a perpetrator or their abuser. I I can't we, I couldn't have anybody else being them coming in and being blindsided on the what ifs that may happen. So that's why I have manuals for everything and everything is scripted. So after, like I said, after they complete all the required training, then they're going to start shadowing myself. Um, I do a lot of hands-on with our new hires um, and they're also gonna sh shadow the legal advocate, the, le the three legal advocates that I have. Um, so this is to ensure that they're ready to go. And then once I feel that they, you know, we're, they're done shadowing us, then we shadow them. And it's probably a good four week process until the shadowing is completed. I also require them to participate in various webinars. Um, I love webinars for training. They're cost, of, they're cost and time effective. And we utilize the coalition's portals for training opportunities as well. We do have reps from PCADV and PCAR who do come out and come out and conduct in-service trainings for our staff. And any local op training opportunities that we may have for like BHC um, or any, any other community organiz organization that we're pro providing any training opportunities, we do ensure that the advocates are able to get out because, you know, it's all about being innovative and, you know, What's next for the victim? What do they need? And we need to be up to date and have the up to date training. So that's that's about wraps up my presentation. You know, it, it's all about build. To me, it's all about building the relationship with the different sectors within your county to ensure the victim is protected, gets the proper services and resources they need, and that offender is held accountable for their crime. You know, there's always three questions that I always tell, I ask myself and I have my legal advocates ask, what does the victim need now? What is the victim gonna need next? And how are we gonna make this happen? You know, not all the services can be provided here at AWARE. So we do a lot of information and referral out because it, you know, it's all about surrounding the victims with all the services and the resources they need to be able to move on, pick out those red flags, and live a happy, healthy lifestyle emotionally and physically. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? I, I have one here for you, how to advance the PPT. I'm sorry, I can't, I'm having a difficulty hearing you. We got that one situated, Brenda. Okay, sorry. Well, if there's no other questions, then, you know, please reach out to me. Um, I, I've shared the PowerPoint. Uh, my, my contact information is on there. I would love to chat. Um, I'm a very passionate person, victim advocacy. 
is what is very dear to my heart and my heart leads my work. So please reach out to me. I would love to chat with all of you. Okay, well, I definitely, I wanna thank you, Rebecca. You did an excellent job. It was an insightful presentation. Um, I don't see any questions, just some thank yous. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast then. Okay, thank you all very much. You have Thank a wonderful you so day. Much. Yes, you do the same.